I really want to start off this morning by thanking all of the leaders in this county for guiding us through the last two and a half years. I'm sure that none of us in this room have ever experienced anything the likes of what we've seen. And we are so fortunate to have our elected officials and our hardworking government officials and community leaders to guide us through this. And we know it's been hard. And we know you're tired. But this is what we are all about at Leadership Fairfax. We help turn leaders into community leaders. And that's all of you here in this room. You all have been playing a part on keeping this county as great as it is and keeping everyone healthy. What I would ask you to do now going forward is support one another. One of the things we know for sure is that the people who have been on the front lines, the people who have been working the hardest to hold up everybody, both at your work and at home and in the community, you're really tired right now. And I get it. It's hard. So support one another. When you go through our programs, we often talk about building your own personal board of directors. Because you meet people in our programs, and you build trust with them, and you have a shared value system. So please call on each other and support one another. We also know that there's a whole lot going on in our world outside of Fairfax County not the least of which is what happened yesterday in Texas. There's so much going on that can bring us down. And I do want to take a moment of silence for the families and the victims of yesterday, as well as for all the people that passed during COVID and those that we also lost over the past couple of years, including one of our very own alums just this weekend, Greg White. So let's take a moment of silence. Thank you. And I know that with the collective leadership, not just in this room, but that rippling effect for all the people that you work with every day, we can make a difference. We can solve problems. We can make this community a place where everyone is healthy, everyone is welcomed, everyone has a voice, and everyone can thrive. I have no doubt that we have the power to make and sustain change. So let's go out and let's do it. Good morning, everybody. You can do better than that. Good morning. There you go. I'm going to invite you to please continue having your breakfast uh, while I share some thoughts with you for the next couple of minutes as we continue our program. My name is Danny Vargas. I'm the president of Arcom Solutions and Marketing and Public Relations firm based right here in Fairfax County. But I also have the honor of serving as chairman of the board of Leadership Fairfax, as well as an alum of the greatest class ever, the class of 2010. <laughs> a little bit controversial. Um, it's so exciting to be here live today with our theme, fresh, live, and in person. And we're all coming together for the first time as a group in 3D in several years. So it's exciting to be here so we can break bread together, we can share some exciting times together, but I also recognize that we're coming together at a time of, of devastating grief, of tremendous sadness and, and horrific loss. But even in those times where we feel helpless, we can't allow ourselves to feel hopeless. In moments of severe and crushing darkness, we can't lose sight of the light. And we're surrounded by division, and strife, we must fight every day with all of our might to forge unity, focus on love, and empower everyone to thrive. You know, our neighbors are counting on us. They're counting on us to lead, especially in the tough times. That's why over the past few months, we've been about the business at Leadership Fairfax of reimagining where we can be in the future. Focusing on developing a strategic plan that allows us to have an even more impactful future, a more significant voice, and be more responsive to the needs of our community. We'll have a leading voice in matters of equity in our community. We'll be developing our future leaders by working with young people. We'll be enabling productive dialogues and rolling out new programs in addition to our existing phenomenal programs. 
And like I said, our neighbors are counting us. They're not asking us for favors. All they want is justice and fairness. They want a shot to breathe air that is filled with opportunity, unity, safety, and joy. And together, we can build a better future for every girl and every boy. And we're going to do that together. But we wouldn't be able to do any of the work that we do at Leadership Fairfax without some important people that I would like to thank right now. So if you're a member of the staff of Leadership Fairfax, please stand up. Please remain standing, please stay, remain standing. Because in addition to our staff, where I've had the great privilege of being able to work with my friend Karen Cleveland, we've got an, an incredible board of directors. So if you're a member of the board of directors, please stand up and stay standing. We've also got incredible volunteers that make our programs possible. Our volunteers, please stand up. And please stay standing. And if you're an alum of any of our Leadership Fairfax programs, please stand up and remain standing. If you're a former staff member, board member, or alum, please stand up and remain standing. And those of you that are still seated, if you know anyone that's gone through the Leadership Fairfax program, please stand up. So everybody stand up. Give yourselves a round of applause because we are Fairfax County. We are the leaders that bring this community together. We are the future of prosperity for Fairfax County. Two thousand and twenty two marks the nineteenth year of this award program, which was instituted to recognize sustained contributions by a public sector employee, employees of nonprofits or appointees of a public board, authority, or commission. Previous recipients of this award are listed in your program, and I'm pleased to welcome some of our previous winners that are here today. Most importantly, former Secretary of the Commonwealth and Chairman of the Board, Catherine K. Hanley. If you stand up when I call your name, Carrie Wilson is also with us. She might not be here yet. Supervisor Walter Alcorn. My friend Captain Willie Bailey with the fire department. Bill Bowie. And Joe Mondoro with Fairfax County. And Kevin Greenleaf. <laughs> Kevin Greenleaf as well. Thank you. I'm happy to report that this year's committee has unanimously recommended the 2022 winner, Thomas Fleetwood, director of the Fairfax County Department of Housing and Community Development. We'd like to welcome Tom's wife and his daughter with, with you here today, too. Tom epitomizes the term public servant. Throughout his 20 plus years with Fairfax County, Tom has served in numerous roles, each time stepping up quietly and faithfully, always leaving things better than how he found them. A steadier hand cannot be found in the ranks of Fairfax County, and to say Tom has made a difference is a major understatement. Since becoming director in 2016, Tom transformed the way the department works with its partners and the community. He truly believes that nonprofits, companies, and county agencies executed on behalf of the county are important partners, and he treats each one as a partner. Tom has immersed himself in the community, and he takes to heart the needs, desires, and interests of all of those voices. A true collaborator, he listens first and then talks, which typically is coupled with self-deprecating humor, a sly pun, or an obscure reference to Pink Floyd. <laughs> and when there's work to be done, Tom ensures that it gets done by bringing together the best people to create a roadmap and get the intended results. During Tom's tenure, the FCRHA has successfully converted its entire public housing stock 
under the Federal Rental Assistance Demonstration RAD program and has implemented critical innovations through FCRHA's prestigious Moving to Work designation. Under his leadership, the Fairfax County Redevelopment and Housing Authority and HCD has delivered a number of landmark affordable housing projects via innovative public-private partnerships, including the award-winning Residence at Government Center, a 279-unit apartment community on the campus of Fairfax County's Government Center, the Falstead at Lewinsville, an 82-unit senior housing development in McLean, and the recently announced financing for the renovation of the 120-unit Little River Glen Senior Community, uh, the Senior Center, and construction of 60 new affordable senior units right next door. Tom also led the charge to develop one university near George Mason. Development of this 10-point-acre site owned by the FCRHA will create 120 affordable senior independent housing units, 120 affordable multifamily units, and 333 student housing units, and will provide much-needed meeting space for the FCRHA. Under Tom's leadership, projects such as these exemplify Fairfax County's use of innovative financing to accomplish great things. Tom Fleetwood truly espouses the Catherine Hanley Public Service Award, and much like the award's namesake, Tom believes in the power of good government to transform, transform individual lives for the better, and in doing so, create vibrant and equitable communities. His work reflects the adage that when everyone does better, everyone does better. Providing safe, sanitary, and affordable housing is in many ways the cornerstone of such communities and Leadership Fairfax is proud to present this award to him. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Tom Fleetwood as we present him the 2022 Catherine K. Hanley Award for Public Service. And Tom, please come on up. Rather than repeat what Kevin Greenleaf has just so accurately said, I'm going to enthusiastically agree with all of it, particularly about Tom's leadership accomplishments, but there is one little detail that needs amplification. Tom may have been with Fairfax County government for 20 plus years, but he has been with Fairfax County and it's the place and its residents for all his life. When he was Tommy, when, my, when he and my daughter both went to the Falls Church High School in the late 80s and played in the band, I even know his mother. How do I know his mother? When I was elected Providence Supervisor in the last century, before elected <laughs> school boards, I nominated his mother to succeed me and represent Providence District on the Fairfax County School Board. She served with exceptional dedication for eight years until elected school boards came along and she declined to run. Part of her experience was in addressing housing issues for Fairfax County residents needing assistance. In part, Tom inherited his exemplary dedication to public service and to the citizens of Fairfax County. It's in his DNA. He is an exceptional Fairfax County resident, citizen, and servant. Thank you, Tommy, because that's how I know him. Thank you, Tommy, for what you do. I See, I really did say it. Thank you for what you do and how you do it for all of Fairfax County's residents. Don't let me drop this. <laughs> Come on over here. Got it? Congratulations, Tom. Thank you very much indeed. You want to say something? 
Uh, my goodness, this is certainly overwhelming. Um, thank you so much, uh, Kate, for that very kind introduction. Uh, and uh, I want to note that Kate really is the only person who retains license to call me Tommy. <laughs> although she does use it with alarming frequency and, en <laughs> and enthusiasm. Uh, I also want to thank you for uh, acknowledging my mother's contributions. My mother is no longer uh, able to participate in events like this, and uh, I'm so grateful to you. Um, I am very deeply grateful to be recognized in Kate's name, uh, especially because of the example of service she's provided uh, to our community for all these years. Thank you so much, Kate. I also want to thank Karen Cleveland and the Board of Leadership Fairfax, including my dear friend Kevin Greenleaf, uh, for this very kind and humbling recognition. The work Leadership Fairfax does in, ra in raising up and preparing leaders in our county is a se an essential element to the vibrancy of our shared public life, and I thank Leadership Fairfax for all that they do. Public service is very much a team sport, as everyone in this room can attest. Nowhere is that more true than in affordable housing, and I cannot begin to pay the debt of gratitude that, that I owe to all those who share in our success. I want to start at home and thank my family who have been a constant source of support. My wife, Marie Angelica, and my daughter, Elena, are here uh, today. And thank you. Um, my son, Nico, had tests today, uh, although I suspect that was an excuse to avoid the possibility of having to hear about the One University Project again. I also, of course, want to thank our Board of Supervisors, led by Chairman McKay. None of what we do in housing would be possible without your support, leadership, and your courage. I have never found you to be too busy to give advice and encouragement as we've worked through incredibly challenging issues together. Thank you. To our Housing Authority Commissioners, many of whom uh, are here today, um, you've been a constant source of support uh, and wise counsel, and we are so grateful. Uh, I especially want to thank our current Chair, Melissa McKenna, who is here today, um, for her partnership and insightful advice, and of course our former Chair, Bob Schwaniger, and all of our Commissioners who are here today. Thank you very much indeed. I need to also thank our county leadership and the many mentors and partners I've been lucky to have. Uh, county Executive Brian Hill, um, Deputy County Executive Chris Leonard, Deputy County Attorney Cynthia Bailey, who I understand is to blame for the pictures, um, former CFO Joe Mondoro, uh, our current CFO Christina Jackson, Chief Equity Officer Car Carla Bruce, and so many others who have supported HCD's work and been such incredible teachers and friends. And finally, I want to thank the staff of the Department of Housing and Community Development, as this recognition truly belongs to you. Many of our senior staff were able to join us here today, and I want you to know that the employees of HCD truly make miracles happen every day. I am so very lucky to get to work with people like Amy Ginger, Vin Rogers, Teresa Lepe, Seema Adjuat, Tom Barnett, all of you, thank you so very much. You are true professionals who make up the finest housing agency in the country. So thank you very much indeed again for this recognition, for the honor of being able to serve, and for all you do to make Fairfax County the very special place it is. Thank you. And now, may we ask that all of the supervisors come up stage left, your right of the platform, and all of our volunteers come up to stage right, your left of the platform.
Ladies and gentlemen, live, fresh, and in person from the magnificent Capital One Hall in McLean, Virginia, and in front of this live audience, for the first time since 2019, we bring you the 2022 Leadership Fairfax Board of Supervisors Exchange. My name is Andy Siegel, LFI 14, best class ever, and it is my pleasure to introduce the stars of our show this morning, your supervisors. <laughs> Representing the Hunter Mill District, Walter Alcorn. Lee District Supervisor, Rodney Lusk. <laughs> Braddock District, James Walkinshaw. Providence District, Dahlia Palchik. <laughs> Mount Vernon, Dan Stork. <laughs> Sully District, Kathy Smith! <laughs> Representing Springfield District, Pat Harity! Gainesville, John Faust! <laughs> the Vice Chair of the Board from Mason District, Penny Gross! And our Chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, Jeff McKay! <laughs> and your host and MC, LFI 99, President of Beach Commercial Real Estate and former Leadership Fairfax Board Chair, please welcome the legendary, the magnificent, Casey Leach! How in the world am I going to follow that? There's no way. Now, it's great to see you guys in 3D. I love it, this is awesome. We're at, raise your hand if this is the first time you've ever been in this venue. Yeah, this is unbelievable, isn't it? Beautiful venue. And of course, you're very fortunate today because these are the ready for prime time players up here on this group. And you guys will see how they will entertain you the whole morning. Sorry about the table um, supervisors, but this, we, um, hey. They want to see you. They really want to see you this year, okay? So we're good. So now it's been three, it's been three years since we've been together, and this is, these, it usually is a very interactive crowd, and the supervisors play off of your reactions. So we have tonight, uh, today our Ambassadors of Fun here to help us, which is uh, from the class of ELI of 2017, which are Mr. Brian Kincaid of the Department of Management and Budget for Fairfax County. 
and Devin Strebig, who is with KPMG. So this side of the room needs to react to the way Devin does it, and that side of the room needs to react the way Brian holds up his sign, and we'll be good to go. Is everybody, are we good with that? Everybody understands? All right, we're good to go. So we always have a great show. These guys play along by our rules, which is great. We, um, as politicians, yeah, we have rules. We have rules. Uh, and um, you all know that politicians can tend to get wordy, not these, not these politicians, because we have our keeper of the clock in the back. And where is my keeper of the clock? She is somewhere here, I hope. Oh, she got lost. Oh, we're in big trouble if this happens. Well, I'll explain it, and then we'll, I'll show you the keeper of the clock. So here's how it works. So we're going to ask the supervisors a question, and they will have the allotted amount of time, whichever we give them at that point. When there is Oh, you got them. Excellent. Okay, so in the back room. So let's do, let's start. No, they're not going to get, oh, that's way too long. <laughs> yeah, that's important. That's important. So what we have is this. When they have 30 seconds left, they will see that sign. And then when it's over, they see that sign. And you don't know, want to know what happens if it goes beyond that sign. So if you notice, there are three new uh, Board of Supervisors up here. And the last ones didn't adhere to it. So that's why we have the new ones here. So. <laughs> so. We're going to start with our opening question for each supervisor. They have 30 seconds to answer the following question. So we all know it's a very stressful job to be any elected official, certainly. And each of you have your own individual, unique, and interesting constituents. So what we want to know is, the burning question from all of us is, how do you relieve or get rid of stress? So I'm going to start with Supervisor Alcorn, and you have 30 seconds. You are on the clock. Go. <laughs> Thank you, Casey. All right, how do I relieve stress? Here's what I do. I dream about not running for re-election. <laughs> and I dream about endorsing John Farrell as my replacement. <laughs> but I just think about it. <laughs> Excellent. Wow, you really crushed the time, too. Okay. Supervisor Palchuk. Well, mine was not the funny this morning, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the regular yoga, meditation, walking, and a whole lot of Netflix. That is what I've gotten through. But then, those of you who haven't been, come up to the perch. That is the most beautiful view of Providence and of Fairfax County. So it's a beautiful place to relieve stress. Excellent. Excellent. They're listening to you, Brian. Okay, so Supervisor Stork. And these are Casey's rules, right? Is that the way? Absolutely Casey right. Rules. Not Robert's Casey rules. These rules. are Casey's rules. That's exactly right? right. That's exactly right. Uh, I do what my constituents are far too often tell me to do, which is to take a hike. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and it seems to clear the mind and helps me relax a little bit. So, Excellent. All right, Supervisor Harity. I didn't work much humor into mine, but uh, for me, it's, it's competition and exercise, and if that doesn't work, it's live music and IPAs. So I used to used to used to do the uh, used to do the uh, rugby thing. Now it's ice hockey, and uh, if that doesn't work, go swim a mile or two in the pool, and that's about it. Excellent. It Excellent. works. Endorphins <laughs> and com and competition. Like it. <laughs> so, Vice Chairman Gross. Crossword puzzles in ink. <laughs> Sometimes quote acrostics also, I especially like the New York Times ones. And old movies from the 30s and 40s, especially if they're black and white. And what's really interesting are the ones that were made before the Hayes Code came in. Oh, I see the reactions. OK, OK. Are you all, are you all following the directions on the reactions, or are you just doing it freelancing? Okay, because we got, you got, oh, oh, so, so, sorry, I'm taking supervisor time away, that's why he's getting me, okay, so, Chairman McKay. Um, I do th three things, I either drink a glass of wine, uh, go for a run, because you can really clear your mind uh, outside for a run, or I go to a kid's sporting or dance event, uh, what I don't do is ever all three of those things at the same time. <laughs> good advice, good advice, okay, Supervisor Faust. Thank you. I uh, spend time with uh, friends and family. Again, of course, uh, a little bit of wine involved. That's awesome. Uh, 
and uh, I recently had a grandson, and uh, lo that nothing makes me relax more than spending time with him. Uh, and I love to exercise, uh, and whether walking or uh, lifting or whatever, uh, it just makes me feel uh, new and ready to start the day. So, uh, thank you. Excellent. All well, right, I, Supervisor Smith. I was going to say I didn't understand the question because I don't know anything about stress, but <laughs> wine, potato chips, and I really record General Hospital soap opera and watch that at night. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can top that. <laughs> Supervisor Les, come on, you can do it. So um, I'm also a runner, so if I can get in like four or five miles uh, three times a week, that helps. Uh, additionally, my daughter is a serious Warriors fan. So right now we're watching the finals and things are going really well. So that's a lot of fun. And then also Netflix. I like to watch the crime documentaries. It just gets me kind of in a different space and place. And those are my three tops. Excellent. Supervisor Walker, yeah, good job. Yep. Yeah, first, Kate, I'm going to be at the Woodhurst HOA annual meeting tonight, and I'm wondering if we can get that same intro brought over Oh, there. absolutely. So you oh, can do, you can we're do mobile. It with we'll me. come with you. <laughs> uh, I have a toddler at home, so I, I, I relieve stress by, by changing diapers and getting yelled at by, by a toddler who just learned to say not nice, so he tells me I'm not nice regularly. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. See, I told you they were entertaining, right? That was the first round. Thank you all for that one. So do we have, what's, what's our first round? Oh, is this an awe? Ha ha ha, okay, gotcha, okay, good. You guys are good over there on this side. Okay, now, before we hit to our two minute round, we have, we have to give the chairman the prerogative. We're gonna give him four minutes to give us an overview of the great things that have happened in the county in the last year. And because he's chairman, and because I don't want to get in trouble, I have to give him four minutes. So, Chairman Jeff McKay, please give us a four minute overview of the last year. Welcome, Chairman McKay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Casey, and thank you all for being here uh, this morning. Uh, Tommy, Congratulations. <laughs> Anyone who calls you Tommy from this point forward, you'll know was at this breakfast. So it'll be a good way to account for folks. Um, it, you know, when I was asked to give a state of the county, I'll just say, of course, what you all already know, uh, which is the state of the county is fantastic. Uh, we have just gone through a very tough period of time, and I couldn't be more proud of this community's belief in science and, most importantly, empathy. Uh, we care about each other. And that's why we get vaccinated, that's why we protect vulnerable people, and that's why our economy has opened back up again and thriving in Northern Virginia because of the quality of the people that live uh, in this community. We recently passed a budget, a budget that I'm very proud of, that increased employee compensation, reduced the tax rate on residential assessments, reduced car taxes, and moved forward with so many priorities we have in Fairfax County, including affordable housing. Uh, which is essential to our economy. Uh, but rather than dwell on the budget, I do, and, and I, I apologize in advance because this is always a really fun event and I certainly am having a great time and uh, Casey does an amazing job keeping this uh, light. Um, but it's hard uh, today, after Tuesday. It's hard uh, to be here and to think about what is happening in this country. On Tuesday morning, our board stood strongly with gun violence awareness advocates, not knowing what was going to happen that afternoon. We later approved a board matter that is looking intensely at substance abuse and mental health challenges, particularly of our kids, our adolescents, who are going through a hard time. I have two of them. I have a middle school and an elementary school kid, and I can tell you it's tough being a kid right now with social media, the weight of the pandemic, mental health, and then what happened on Tuesday. Um, I also have a fourth grader, ironically. Uh, at home. And when I got home from the board meeting Tuesday, before the news of what had happened could be shared with my own kids, my son told me what he did in school that day, ironically, which was a lockdown drill. And Wednesday morning, when I put my kid on the bus, I held him a little bit tighter, and I thought, what is wrong with this country? Parents everywhere else in the world send their kids off to school thinking, I hope you make a new friend, eat a healthy lunch, pass a test, obey adults. In this country, parents like me have to pray that our kid comes home alive. 
It's wrong. Every person in this room has an ability to do something about it. We banned firearms in county buildings. This board did. Nine to one, we banned firearms in county buildings and county facilities to set a tone to say, inconveniences are not more, in people, more important than people's lives. We live in a country, sadly, where far too many of our children live in fear and they're looking to adults to do something about it. So I challenge everyone in this room to think about those 19 kids, those fourth graders. I think about mine. I see my son in those kids. And to stop talking about stuff and do something. We've done what we can do in Fairfax County, but it is not enough. It is not enough. It is not enough to sit on the sidelines any longer and allow us to live in fear. We have to protect our kids. We have to protect our adults. We have to be able to walk around this county, thankfully, to our men and women in law enforcement and our first responders, the safest jurisdiction of our size in the United States. And, and that's something we can be very proud of. I saw Dr. Braybrand here. Uh, thanks to Dr. Braybrand, our schools are amazing teachers. Our schools is as safe as they possibly can be. And, and they do enormous work every year, every day, uplifting our children in our Fairfax County public schools. But I challenge you, if an 18-year-old can go out and buy weapons designed to kill massive numbers of people in short periods of time, we can do everything we can addressing mental health, securing our schools, raising our kids the right way, inspiring them. But we need more than that. We need serious help uh, to be able to create the safest community that our kids can live in confidence in. And so I apologize coming here today on such a somber note and bringing that up, but I am not going to forget thinking about those 19 kids. I will not forget about it. I will not forget that every day more than 110 Americans are killed by gun violence. Thankfully, not in Fairfax County. But we have a moral obligation at this moment in time, in my mind, to do something substantive, to save the most precious thing we have, human life and our kids in particular, tomorrow's leaders. There are 190,000 kids in Fairfax County public schools sitting in classrooms today asking us to be the adults asking us to be strong, to be strong-willed, to support what I not, no longer call common sense gun restrictions. I don't call them that anymore. I call them the difference between humanity and being inhumane. When I grew up as a kid, people smoked cigarettes in airplanes. Inconvenience? No longer you can do that because we're trying to save lives. We were lucky to wear lap belts in cars. Now we have airbags and shoulder straps. Why? Because technology. Empathy, the kind of empathy we have in Fairfax County. Not inconveniences, sacrifices all of us can make to protect people's lives. It's not a lot to ask. And so please, in the days, weeks, months ahead, years ahead, don't forget about these kids and our obligation in Fairfax County to protect people as best we can. And so I feel very good about where we are as a county. Uh, frankly, I'm challenged about where we are as a country. But this community believes fundamentally in these things. This community believes in humanity, believes in empathy, believes the first thing we should do is protect the most vulnerable people in our population. We also are an open, welcoming community, an international community where people all over the world can come here and feel safe and be successful in our strong economy. And those are assets that don't happen automatically. They happen because of all of you in the room and what you contribute to making this not only a great place to live, a great place to raise kids, but most importantly, an extraordinarily strong economy where our multicultural community comes together, bonds together, works together. That we can all be proud of, and that is, is a main takeaway. So thank you all very much for being here, your support of LFI. Um, this board does amazing work. I couldn't be more proud uh, to serve with them. And congratulations, Tommy. <laughs> Thanks, Chairman McKay. And as somebody who grew up in Fairfax County, this is the best place in the world. 
to, to grow up. I mean, I, I'm a product of Fairfax County Schools and, and um, love the people here, and it is a very diverse region, which is just awesome. So uh, it, it's just a blessing that I, I was able to, and a privilege I was able to grow up here. And thank you for your leadership the last two years, too. It's been a, it's been a crazy time, crazy time. So. Tommy, Tom, I mean Tommy, where, Tom, where, where is Tom? Where is he sitting? There he is. Tom, since you are the guest of honor today, um, you get to choose the first question. So, all you got to do is give me a number between one and nine. Seven. Seven. Great choice. Excellent choice. That is Supervisor Smith. Supervisor Smith, you get to lead off. Perfect. So, Land Use staff has been working very hard on this project called Parking Reimagined and also something called the SSPA. Now, I know this is a lot to summarize in two minutes, but can you give us highlights um, in two minutes? And Susan's ready on the clock. Okay, Supervisor Smith, you can go. Thank you very much. Um, we love our acronyms, but we have this great name for something called Parking Reimagined. Did you realize that we have not looked comprehensively at our parking rates since 1988? I was going to ask how many people have, you know, were born after 1988. Um, and so in this process, staff has been going out and meeting with people in the community, meeting with businesses, looking at how we provide parking. We have Metro that we didn't have in 1988 expanding. And so they're going through this process looking at should we change parking rates? Those of you that have businesses know that's an effect of when you build a building and how much parking you need. Um, so looking at that through the county, recognizing that the county is very different. I represent Sully District, so we don't have that much transit out there. So we need to make sure if we go somewhere we have cars and we're able to park. So that process is, is going on. You can participate and provide information to us. The other is SSPA, Site Specific Plan Amendment. And that's a process that has taken a lot of time. It's been a four-year cycle. We look at our comprehensive plan that says where things could be built, built and gives general guidance. And we were doing a cycle. North County took two years, South County took two years or more, and then we'd start again. And because that process is so long, a lot of things would come to the board and we'd do what we call out-of-turn amendments. So we're going through a process. We had a great working committee with two supervisors and two planning commissioners, and we came up with this great idea, and I know Rodney, as we move forward, Rodney and I were the supervisors, that when we move forward, our board, the planning commission and our boards are going to love what we came up with, but we're trying to have a better process because we know things don't stay the way they always were. We want to change, we want to make this a, a place where people can live, work, and play, and, and be able to live close to where they work, so it's going to be a great process, and I know my colleagues are going to love it. Thank you. Excellent. She got it, didn't she? Okay. Sheriff Stacy Kincaid. Aren't you happy to see your grandson running around here doing his great work, Brian Kincaid? <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm kidding. You know I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm totally teasing you. So, you can choose any number. Please don't arrest me afterwards. <laughs> Brian put me up to it. Oh, I mean, no, no, Devin did, Devin did, sorry. So, any number but seven or four? Uh, how about eight? Number eight. That's what we will go with. Supervisor Stork. So, <laughs> speaking of today's theme of live, fresh, and in-person with tourism coming back, right? We got rebounding from COVID. I understand that you just launched a Fairfax South tourism brand and knowing how creative you are, I'm sure it's going to be very creative and innovative. So you get to be on the clock for two minutes and tell us all about it. Oh, thank you, Casey. And we have a stand over there that shows the, the new logo and the branding that we've done. Um, about 2019, um, I put together a Mount Vernon task force, which really has ultimately become a South County task force on tourism. And we brought in a lot of folks together, but most importantly, we brought in Barry Bigger and Visit Fairfax. And collaboratively, we brought, we essentially put together all the different venues that are in the South County area, Fairfax County. I think uh, many of you know, probably the most famous, George Washington's Mount Vernon. But we also have, I think most of you all know, is the National Museum of the US Army. But how about the Workhouse Arts Center? 
folks right over there and, and have done a great job of, of really bringing, if you will, adaptively reusing the former Lorton prison. George Mason's home, we've got uh, the, National, the National Park Service on the George Washington Memorial Parkway, Fort Hunt Park. We've got uh, State uh, Park and Mason Neck State Park, two regional parks in Aquaquan and Pohick. Uh, lots of different things going on, but the core of it is we brought people together because we are together as a place to come. In fact, the more places to come than anywhere else, I think, in the country, aside from out uh, beside the mall itself in D.C. Why do we do that? Because it's a way of promoting tourism in our community. It's a way of, of bringing people together, a way of reinvigorating and revitalizing and, frankly, bringing new restaurants and new entertainment and new experiences. So you can go anywhere from bird watching to, to um, historical review. You can, you can have um, catering at some of the nicest places around. Uh, so we, we, we essentially have it all in a place that, that there are lots of different options for people. So, Come on down, see Potomac Banks, uh, explore Fairfax South, that's our logo, and we'd love to kind of give you the ideas. Go to the website, that's probably the most important thing. You can either go to the Fairfax, uh, the Visit Fairfax website, or you can go to the, the fairfaxcounty.gov forward slash Mount Vernon website and learn a lot more about what we're doing and, and why you need to come. So thank you. Excellent, thank you, Supervisor Stewart. Oh, there is in, uh, there should be at many of your places a challenge coin with the new logo on it, and you're welcome to uh, take a look at that as well. Thank you. Great. Okay, so Anthony Grupo, Cigna, thank you guys again for sponsoring. So you get to choose one, two, three, or nine. Number nine. Here we go. That will be Supervisor Walkinshaw. So I understand you recently opened a new wellness center for older, older adults in the Braddock District. What kind of services does this facility offer and what kind of statement do you think that makes about Fairfax County and how we're treating our older adults in, in this kind of facility? Yeah, thank you, Casey. La just last week, uh, Chairman McKay and I uh, celebrated Older Adults Awareness Month, which is, which is May, by cutting the ribbon on the new wellness center for older adults at the Glens, which is a complex that was mentioned during Tommy's introduction. Um, already an amazing facility for seniors with the senior center and affordable, affordable apartment units. And the new wellness center uh, is free. Uh, offers is already today offering uh, health screenings, wellness screenings, counseling, yoga classes, art therapy classes, there are even dance therapy classes and after I heard this my colleagues talking about how they deal with stress I'm gonna sign all nine of them up for a dance therapy class there uh, but it's really an amazing facility and I think it sends a very strong signal that there's no better place in America to age in place than Fairfax County. Uh, we're gonna do everything in our power to give older adults the opportunities and the tools that they need to continue to thrive and contribute right here in Fairfax County. Excellent, thank you. So now we're gonna go to our first speed round question. I hope you are ready. We will start actually with Supervisor of Walk and Shaw and they're gonna go down very quickly. Now, I can't remember what our record is for answers. I don't know if Susan remembers, but this one's a little bit trickier because of the, of the kind of question. So we won't, we'll, it won't be a time for a record. It'll just be quick and fun and pithy and all that stuff. Okay, so mm -hmm. Supervisor Walk and Shaw, we're gonna start with you and we're gonna run down the line as fast as you can. What would be the title of your autobiography? Starting with Supervisor Walkinshaw, go. Hmm, what would be the title of my autobiography? <laughs> Time. Um, <laughs> Time up. That's it. That that's would. It. That's it. My title of my autobiography would be, what would be the title of my autobiography? Absolutely. Super, <laughs> Supervisor Lusk, quick. Uh, being of service to others and never quitting. Love it. From first grade classroom to boardroom in 357 easy steps. <laughs> <laughs> Only you will get this. A frustrating odyssey in search of the third clap. <laughs> I do get that. Yes, I do. And they do too. So <laughs> These guys get paid by the word. Mine would simply be blessed. 
Um, mine would be People, Politics, and Penny, A Life in the Arena. <laughs> I'll read that. That would be fun. Uh, mine would be what my wife and my family would all say, which is, waiting for Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Um, mine would be, it's all about community from the ground up. Thanks. Uh, and with all the planning stuff I've been involved with other, over the years, it would have to be an unplanned life. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I told you they get it. They're very concise. Okay, so Lynn Strobel, you were 04, correct? All right, from Walsh Kalushi. Thank you always for sponsoring as well. So you get to choose one, two, or three. N of course, number one, that is Supervisor Alcorn. <laughs> so, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. Okay, I don't want to get in trouble the way I say this, but um, with this <laughs> phase two of the silver line still not open. <laughs> <laughs> And with Metro facing a range of financial and other management challenges, um, can we still depend on Metro as a cornerstone of future growth in the Dulles Quarter? Is that, was that, did I say that politically correctly enough, or is that? That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the short answer is we have to. Um, I, I just want to look around right here. Here we are next next to one of the four metro stations, metro rail stations in Tyson's. This area was planned because of metro rail. So Fairfax County, at least in the Dulles Corridor, has really, we have, we have bet our economic future on metro rail. So it has to work. I, I think we're gonna look back in a few years and see this as the time when Metro was facing its biggest challenges, and it's got huge challenges. I mean, we've got safety issues. Uh, really top to bottom in the organization, there have to be improvements. But in Fairfax County, we have bet our future on Metro Rail, not just here in Tysons, also in Reston, in, in Herndon, and in other parts of the county as well. So. Anyway, there are many things that are going to have to be done over the coming years. One of the things I'd encourage everybody to keep their eye on is the financial sustainability of our metro rail system. We're the only major transit system in the country that does not have a dedicated revenue source to support its operations. That's probably going to need to change. So you may have heard it here first, uh, but let's, let's be ready to deal with that over the coming years. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, Brian Jackson, LFI 2006, Booz Allen Hamilton, my friend since middle school. Choose between number two and number three. Three. I'm sorry, that is incorrect. We were looking for number two. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor Faust. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> He's my friend. Come on. So, oh my God. Fairfax County recently won an award from the Northern Virginia Affordable Housing Alliance for its policy of making public land available for affordable housing projects. Why is that policy important and what other policies is the Board of Supervisors pursuing to develop and preserve affordable housing? Thank you. Um, any policy that helps us advance the goal of delivering more affordable housing in Fairfax County is important. Uh, we have a, a population where one-fifth of our, uh, the residents of Fairfax County are paying 50% or more of their income uh, on housing. And that leaves not enough money for the, the other essentials in life. So it is our goal as a board to do more to deliver affordable housing in Fairfax County. Uh, Tom Fleetwood, the amazing director of our housing department, uh, provided us with a, uh, worked with the uh, community and provided us with a strategic plan that uh, gives us the direction we need as a board to start implementing. Uh, that plan told us that we needed 15,000 uh, new affordable dwelling units over the next 15 years in Fairfax County. We as a board uh, committed to delivering 5,000 of those units uh, uh, and uh, 
the, the amazing thing is uh, we we made so much progress initially that recently the chairman uh, initiate, uh, asked us to go to 10,000 and we did. Right. So we are now uh, working on our goal of delivering 10,000. This program where the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors goes out and identifies l land that we own within Fairfax County to work in private uh, public-private partnerships with uh, low-income housing developers makes it possible for those developers to pencil out their projects because they no longer have to come up with the millions and millions of dollars needed in Fairfax County to buy the land. So uh, they're able to develop on our Fairfax County property uh, at their expense but charge a rent that is substantially below market. So it's a uh, program that has a, a limited life. I mean, there's only so much Fairfax County property out there, but in the interim, we've delivered thousands of units because of this program. So uh, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So Rick Peterson, yes, you can't drink yet, hold on. So uh, number one, thank you for everything your family has done for Northern Virginia. It's incredible what the Peterson Foundation has done and just you all as a family have done. We really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. What year were you in LFI? Ninety-three. Ninety-three. Wow. Okay, excellent. So this qualifies you. Um, oh. Number three, five, or six? Number three, that would be Vice Chairman Penny Gross. So please tell us about the Economic Incentive Program and how it's being implemented in the Mason District. Thank you, Casey. In September of 2020, the board adopted a new program called the Economic Incentive Program, or we call it EIP, and it provides economic incentives to the private sector to purchase, assemble, revitalize, and redevelop property for economic development purposes. The application has to be in one of six areas, uh, incentive areas, including Annandale, Bailey's Crossroads, Seven Corners, those are both in um, uh, Mason District and Lincolnia also, and then also McLean, Richmond Highway, and Springfield. Uh, you have to have at least two acres consolidated and uh, make the application to the Board of Supervisors. The financial incentives include a 10% reduction in the site plan fees and a partial abatement of real estate taxes on the difference between the base value of the property and its post-development uh, values. And the first um, application that we received was about 15 minutes after we approved the program. Uh, and that is in Skyline, where Rob Seldon uh, has, uh, uh, is working on three buildings. If you know Skyline, it's a three, what I call the three black buildings. They're about 14 stories high. And um, he is, has uh, assembled and is repurposing three existing 16-story office, office buildings for live, work, use. There are five parcels with three owners totaling 6.54 acres in Skyline. The base value of the project site was a little over $22 million. The estimated final value is $155 million as for a difference of 132 million, but who's counting? Um, the resulting annual tax savings is estimated to be 1.48 million, which would be available for up to 10 years. So those of you who are looking at our economic incentive areas, we are still uh, accepting applications and we're very excited about this program. And I'm really pleased that the first use of it is in Mason District. Excellent. Do you see how these these people hit their timing? Unbelievable. I mean, that's just that's just great. You guys are you guys are real politicians. I mean, like the you guys are legit politicians, not the ones who ramble on and on and on. You guys are the ones who make your points and get out. I love it. I love it. So, um, Devin and uh, Brian, please get in position. Um, right after this, we're going to have a trivia question. So, I want to do another speed round, uh, starting with Walter this time, Supervisor Alcorn. Uh, this can be fast. This can be fast. Would you rather be a rock star, a movie star, or a professional athlete? We're going to time this, Susan, and see how fast we go. On your mark, get set, go. None of the above. I just want to be a public servant. <laughs> <laughs> rock star. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. Hold up, nope. hold up. <laughs> Are you that. serious? Walter. Okay, Supervisor Alcorn, let's start this again. 
There are three choices. <laughs> it's rock star, it's movie star, it's professional athlete. Now understand, you don't have to go out of here and be that. Okay, this is hypothetical, so can you play along? <laughs> Just wanna make sure, we're good. Professional athlete. Thank you, there we go. <laughs> rock star. Uh, movie star because there are many, many people out there that you could portray. I mean, a lot of different characters, a lot of different ways to, to represent yourself. I think your typecast is Lincoln, so I hate to tell you. <laughs> Casey, if you remember a few years ago, uh, movie star. <laughs> and she is, trust me. Professional athlete. Professional athlete. Movie star. Professional athlete. Professional athlete. This is breaking down on gender lines a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent job. Excellent job. See, they, but Walter was a little slow on the tough tip, but hey, you know, this is your first live and in-person one, so we'll give you a break on that. It's, a, it's okay. Okay, so now we have a trivia question. We have not tried this before. Uh, Devin, can you come to the, oh, you want to do it from the back? You can do it from the back of the room. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to ask the question. And the first person to raise their hand and answer correctly, as done by Devin, gets the prize. And the first prize is, well, it was going to be um, a bag of Hershey's Kisses, but Brian thought he was just giving one out and he got into them, and so they were kind of opened. But, but, oh my God. <laughs> but, 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 but you'll get an almost full bag of Hershey's Kisses if you want, okay? So. All right, so here's a question. In which county district did both George Mason University and Northern Virginia Community College get their start? A, Braddock, B, Mason, C, Mount Vernon, D, Drainsville. She got Sorry, it. Sorry, that is incorrect. Next. <laughs> that, that was correct. That's not, no. Well, see, now we got controversy. No, it's not right. Restate the question. Do I need to restate the question? In which district did both George Mason University and Northern Virginia Community College get their start? A. Braddock, B. Mason, C. Mount Vernon, D. Drainsville. This is before redistricting or after. Oh, now we're getting technical. It's just for Hershey's Kisses, please. So, uh, we're going to let Kate Hanley do it? Okay, go ahead. I mean, I, I, this, I didn't think it was going to be this tough because the person, who, the person who gave it, if I say it, then you're going to know who it is. So, uh, we'll give one more chance, Devin. Oh, she's still got a Hershey's Kiss anyway. Okay. <laughs> Mark Looney is correct, it is Mason District. Now, there sounds like there's some controversy up here. So, so there's a little controversy, but so do you want to, do you want to explain? explain? Okay, so. Uh, I, yes, it was Mason District. Uh, it started at Northern Virginia Community College, was originally Northern Virginia Technical College, and started in 1965 in Mason District in the Bailey's Crossroads, and George Mason University, which was, uh, the forerunner was the University of Virginia, I believe, and it was, and they both started about almost in the same building in Mason District back in the mid-60s. Now you tell me this is an informative program today. <laughs> Imagine that if you get that on Trivial Pursuit one time. So, so. Man, that was, I did not expect this to be this controversial. I, I thought this was just fun, but just, now I'm feeling like you guys feel at a board meeting. Oh my goodness, so. All right, so next question is, is this. Devin, are you ready? So the next question is, I hope this isn't controversial. So, and again, uh, Supervisor Gross's favorite candy is Hershey's Kisses, which is why you got the Hershey's Kisses. So, oh, this is not going the way I thought it was gonna go. So, not including a building structure, what is the highest land elevation in Fairfax County? So, we have A, Route 123 and Route 7, which is the old Clyde site. B, Mount Murtaugh, which is the old landfill at Route 66 and West Docks. Reston Town Center at Reston Parkway and Temporary Road. Or the I-95 landfill complex, which is the future site of the indoor ski facility. Right 
You say D, which is the I-95? Sorry, that is incorrect. And these are, these are, I guess they're good because they're hard. Go keep going. Who do you, you got? Who do you got? Okay. 123 and 7. No, sorry, that is incorrect. Well, it is, and she's right. It's B, which is Mount Murtaugh, which is the old landfill at Route 66 in West Stocks. They call it Mount Murtaugh because that was one of the. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's the built up landfill like Mount Trashmore. It is named for Mount Murtaugh because it was the old engineer in the sanitary department. That's all I know. <laughs> but, but, so. We have serious controversy, um, so I'm going to have to talk with my supervisors on that. And I, out of what do we call that? What do we call? Do we? How do we break session? What do we do? So this, yeah, executive session or something after this. Oh my goodness! How do you relieve stress again? What's the, what's the thing that you guys do? All right, so my goodness, it's not supposed. To, all right, Justin, please help me here. Justin Rubles. Okay, so here's here's what we got. Boston properties, you guys are always have the answers, right? I know you do. So, number five or number six? Number five, good choice. Thank you very much. So, Supervisor Lusk. Now, I, this is a good one. I have heard from multiple people that you have done an outstanding job with this thing called Wish, and they, they give you rave reviews. I, I mean, so much so I want to ask for your autograph afterwards. I'm going to tell you that I'm not exaggerating. So it's a Richmond-based workforce innovation and skills hub that's proposed to open in July of this year. You're getting rave reviews. Um, please tell us about this. Okay, so it's Richmond Highway based. So just behind the Costco, if you are familiar with Richmond Highway, there's a community called Audubon. It has about 700 mobile home units in that community, we're going to build a community center, which I'm going to give some kudos here to our chairman, Jeff McKay, and the Department of Housing and Community Development for acquiring the asset, which gave me a location for the Workforce Innovation Skills Hub. This facility will serve some of the most underserved folks in this county. Many of them lost their jobs as a result of COVID. I think it was about 90%. Uh, of the folks who live in that community were jobless when the stay-at-home orders were announced because many of them worked in hospitality, retail, service-based positions. So as a result of that, it became pretty imperative that we needed to do something. So the idea was to create a center that would be focused on employment first and work the skills necessary for that employment with individual partners. So we have partners in this room who include ANOVA, who include Dominion, who include all of the skilled trades here in Northern Virginia and the DC metro area, and there's 13 of them. So what we'll do is provide apprenticeship training, technology training, and I want to say for the jobs of the future as it relates to green energy building and construction technologies. And the beauty here is that the folks who live in this community who've been relegated to jobs that pay only minimum wage at best, many of them are making 10, 12, 14 dollars an hour. We're going to start them at least at 20 to 24, and we're going to give them a pathway to get into the middle class. What will that do? It will transform their lives. They'll be able to have health care. They'll be able to send their kids to college. They'll be able to afford to purchase housing here in Fairfax County. That's what we're doing, and I'm so excited about it. And I'll say thank you, Casey, for your introductory comments. No autographs necessary. <laughs> this is for the people in that community who need it. Thank you. Great. I have to ask, so where did you go to college? Um, if, if I can take one liberty first, since you gave me a little more time. Uh, this is for somebody by the name of um, Carmine Michael Ferraro, graduate of the best class, the class of 1998. I'm also a graduate of a school with a young man at the very end of this, Supervisor Alcorn. We graduated both from University of Virginia with Casey. Um, our class was the class of 1988. Ooh. 
I did not know that. That's a fine institution. Fine institution. You're making us proud. I, I love it. I love it. Okay, so Brooke Wright, Fairfax County Police. What year were you? 2017. Thank all of you for your service, by the way, and thank you for being here today. Give the our police yeah. Yeah. I was going to give you a choice, but Supervisor Herity left, so sorry, no choice. I just want to recognize you. So hi. <laughs> okay, so you know who's left. Supervisor Palchik, are you all set? Set as I'll be. How many children do you have? Oh my God. <laughs> And, and how's that going? Well, um, it was funny hearing my colleagues talk about going home and, and relaxing with their kids. Um, it is, I love my four month old. Um, it is usually relaxing um, when she's sleeping, but right now, <laughs> she did sleep last night, so a, a, a big clap for Sivan for sleeping last night. <laughs> Well, th and thank you for being here. Thank you for your service. For uh, that's a, that's a lot <laughs> to of a four-month-old and 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 be with us, especially. So, yeah. we all know that Tyson's is critical to the success of Fairfax County, and 90% of it is in your district. So, no pressure, no pressure at all. That so, was for you, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> what are you seeing with regard to placemaking in Tyson's Corner? Good. Well, happy to answer that. First of all. Um, Brooke is amazing, so uh, I, I'm grateful that she honorarily got to choose me. Um, <laughs> we miss you in the Mason District, but I know you're doing wonderful things for our police academy, so thank you. Um, and Walter, I know, 10% is in Hunter Mill, so Casey, thank you for letting me be clear so that Walter doesn't get mad at me. <laughs> right. Um, but it is, so placemaking, um, you know, and I think what I, when I mentioned my biography was, it's all about community. Um, so I was born in Argentina in the heart of Buenos Aires, a huge metropolis. Um, my parents left, uh, brought us here in 1990, no, 1989, we got our green card in 92. Um, uh, to give us a better opportunities. And we grew up uh, post oil spill in a beautiful uh, neighborhood called Mantua. Um, also the residence of now Congressman Connolly. So we have excellent leadership from Kate Hanley all the way, uh, I'm honored and have big shoes to fill here in Providence District. But for me, the number one thing, um, and, and for many years I lived in the district, like my seatmate at my table, um, and it felt like there was community in Fairfax County, but sometimes it was hard to find unless you knew where to go. Um, when when uh, Maryfield created the Mosaic District, I said, all right, mom and dad, I'm ready to come and live closer to you. I don't need the big city. Um, and also Tyson's was growing. And we have these beautiful buildings. We are in the heart of Tyson's in Providence District right now, Hunter Mills down the road. Um, and we have this beautiful structures, a plan that I believe also Walter helped put together uh, about a decade ago, just a little bit. And um, we have a beautiful plan. But to me, the, the big thing and the, the, the part that I wanted to ensure we really elevated and grow um, and move forward is the part of the, the community, the heart, the soul. I think the only one who chose rock star because I love the arts and music. Um, and so we're, I want to see Tyson's as an art hub. You know, until this building was built, the Kennedy Center was still a place I had to go downtown to get that kind of music venue and art venue. And so to me, places from this Capital One Hall to the park at Tyson's, which we now have at the former artist known as a container store, um, it really is about the heart and soul. What What is in this built environment that we're creating? What are these streets, these sidewalks? We want to connect the communities from here all the way up to Dallas. I know she's holding up that sign. I love her hair and her sign. Um, <laughs> but I was very brief before, so I just wanted to take a few minutes to say, you know, we build a lot, and many of you here help us build a beautiful community but as I was talking to my seatmate DC is a fun place but I want to bring all those people all those businesses right here to Fairfax County to Tyson's Mosaic Mount Vernon Reston everywhere Springfield because this is the best place to live in the whole wide world just thank you thank you Supervisor Palchuk <laughs> so um, for, the, for this last part here I just wanted to say this uh, we're in a room full of leaders and every, all of you lead somewhere. 
and your leading by example is extremely important. And um, there's a really smart guy in the Bible named Jesus who said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I think we have to be very careful that we look at how we are spending our time and our money. Because we can talk all we want, but then when you go back and look at your calendar, you go back and look at where you're spending your money, that's where your heart really is. So Jesus gave us a, an easy way to evaluate that. So are we really practicing what we preach? And I think if we all really be, are honest with ourselves, because you hear a lot of rhetoric all the time, but there are a lot of you in this room that I see at, I see you actually showing up at places. I also see you giving money to things. That really shows you where your heart is. And so he gave us an easy way to evaluate that. So what I, and what I want to say with regard to that is about this group right here. Guarantee you, you look at their calendar, it shows where their heart is. They are committed to this county. They are committed to serving us. They, just the fact that they're here today shows you they're very, as you all know, very busy people. But if you look at their calendar, guarantee you that it'll show you where their heart is. So um, I, I just want to take this time on behalf of LFI, number one, to thank you all for always showing up for this event. Number two, I know you go to a lot of the class days, so we really appreciate that. And then from the whole group here, we just want to thank you all for serving our community and taking the time from your families and for, from your work and everything you do to serve us. We really do appreciate it. Even though you guys don't get a lot of attaboys and attagirls, you guys deserve a lot of credit. And, and thank you all for, uh, for your dedication to our county. From the very beginning, the strength of the organization was volunteers, volunteers who were giving their time and energy to make the airport um, all that it could be. For 55 years, we've been advocates for transportation, infrastructure for the airport, and the region. I have an article that's in the memoirs of Hal Launders, and it says rail to Dulles in 72, believe it or not. Look how long it's taken. It wasn't just the federal funds that were involved, local funds had to be involved. So it was a question of how was Fairfax and eventually Loudoun going to pay their share. The landowners around Tyson's Corner finally realized that they needed rail through Tyson's. And they came up with a, a special tax district for all the businesses that owned property along where the rail was going to be. That concept went on to phase two of, of of Dulles Rail with the Dulles Quarter um, Tax District. We uh, worked with um, other organizations to encourage continued support from the business community and the state of Virginia in their participation. We spent time in Richmond lobbying for what we were trying to uh, accomplish. Uh, we did position papers on local and um, statewide issues um, and testified before local and um, state agencies and, and the legislature. Going down to, to Congress and meeting with congressmen down, and women down there to try to make sure that they heard our voices and, and knew how important this was. The Committee for Dallas has become an important part of the community. Elected officials rely on us, the public relies on us, we're able to see issues and educate people about land use decisions, economic development, and other growth potentials for the airport, which are going to benefit all of us. Well, it's been a, a, a terrifically uh, consistent in its advocacy over time, supporting both the airport, uh, rail access, road access to the airport, uh, the growth of cargo traffic, and the growth of passenger traffic. During my term, they were just beginning, or just in the middle of construction for the phase one of the uh, interchange project on Route 28. Uh, that's something to celebrate. We worked on that for years. Now that project is complete. We worked very closely 
uh, with uh, the Smithsonian to, to try to do whatever we could to ensure that the Air and Space Museum become located at the, in the Dulles Corridor. The official announcement of the building of the Air and Space Museum was done in May of 1999 by Admiral Ingen, the head of the Air and Space Museum, and he did it at a Committee for Dulles luncheon. In fact, there was someone that was in attendance when it was over that donated a million dollars to to the Air and Space Museum that day. We uh, uh, have maintained or, or gained uh, international recognition from markets outside of our country. Uh, most, most famously is the uh, Frank Frankfurt Airport. We met with teams from Geneva, Switzerland, who wanted to know how a community organization can help the airport. We also met with teams from Paris, France, about how to connect two airports and citizen engagement and public advocacy to the benefit of the economic development of a nation's capital's airports. When you look at the airport um, itself, it's tough to think about 12,000 acres as having a sense of community. It's an awful large area. It's a, it's a huge amount of um, land area, infrastructure, employees. Uh, but every event that is held um, either by the authority, by the airport, or through the committee events, you really get a sense of pride and contribution to the community. Our events are there to promote and foster the growth of Dulles Airport and to keep the communities aware and educate them on the future economic development of the airport and its environs. If it's a luncheon or if it's a gala or if it's uh, a, you know, another event, you'll have a significant representation of the various industries in our region and it gives us an opportunity to share uh, uh, not only how, uh, what we do but how we can help them. I asked the question, you know, is there any way we could leverage this group um, to help the community? And that's when the Committee for Dulles Community Outreach was born. Number one priority would be to give scholarships to deserving high school seniors. Every year we give 15, 20, 20 plus scholarships to students, uh, all who are connected to Dulles Airport. And then we also supported the um, Interfaith Chapel and the Traveler's Aid organizations at the airport. A hundred percent of the money that we, uh, the, the uh, outreach committee uh, raises, goes back to the community. Whether it's the community outreach scholarship fund uh, or the run on the runway uh, or the plane pool, uh, you really get a sense that this is a tight community that, that supports itself. The relevance of the Committee for Dulles is more important today than ever because of the growth in international business and the growth in data centers in this area, we have become an even bigger economic engine and not just the airport, but the services that are around the airport and all of the national and international companies that have headquartered here. Okay, here we are, we've accomplished so much. What is it that we want to accomplish working with the airport? How do we move forward as a partner with the airport? Uh, the pandemic, in my mind, um, forced us to be more creative, uh, forced us to be more innovative, and to move forward with the way that we uh, touched the community. Obviously, with the pandemic over the last years, there's been some erosion in uh, passenger loads, uh, passenger frequency, flights, and what have you. So there's the opportunity to try to continue the path upward to the ultimate capacity of the airport, which I'm told is in the range of 55 million passengers per year. And as you have more planes, it can impact residential areas uh, to a greater extent. So we are a strong supporter of making sure that our local communities do not enact land use decisions that put people in the flight path of oncoming or departing uh, air, airplanes. That's something that we tried to work on as well as the ground transportation for access to and from the airport beyond rail. We still see a continuing role for Committee for Dulles. Uh, someone who's looking at the airport and always trying to think, how can this get better? How can we 
improve Dallas to become part of an even bigger part of the Washington economy. My expectation is the committee for Dulles will go on for many years to come. Rest an Opportunity Neighborhood and the Neighborhood Ambassador Program is just one example of a number of supportive programs and resources that Cornerstones provides to families and individuals on their journey to a better life. Participation provides ways for residents in low-income neighborhoods to help lift up their voice and identify and prioritize their needs. These are the very same neighborhoods in which Cornerstones works to implement interventions and provide supportive care. Neighborhood ambassadors are active change leaders, problem solvers, and advocates for the change they and their neighbors want to see. Neighborhood ambassadors resident leaders from the five Opportunity Neighborhoods, are integral partners participating at every level of leadership in our Opportunity Neighborhood structure in order to identify and address social and racial inequities in our community. Saizana is a dedicated volunteer and passionate advocate for her community. She saw a need among the women in her neighborhood who might benefit from greater independence and inclusion into the larger community. So she began leading a free weekly English class at the Southgate Community Center. Having the language is, always, is a good start to being anywhere, I think. Um, it's a confidence building. You know, just to be able to say hi and bye in the language of amongst, you know, the community that you live in, I think is crucial. So, you know, when the kids come home from school, maybe they'll bring pieces of homework they may not understand. But at least they know, I too am learning like you. And, and this uh, is a continuous journey for everybody in different scale. A lot of the women in the class um, have gone on to continue um, the education. Many have taken, are taking the GED uh, night classes, you know, and continuing English classes at the community college. I'm very proud of that. Many of them, some of them have come in with learner's permit when they started the class, but they've now taken that extra step of getting their driver's license, which is a huge deal. It's just, it's just a stepping stone to say, you know, what else and what's next? It'd be wonderful, I think, if the community, individuals, families, the community together um, tr have the trust in themselves, that they have all they need to, to succeed. And that when they have that confidence to say, I know what I want, we, me, the neighborhood ambassador, you know, the PCAs, the program coordinator, advocates, really the, the, out, the resource providers, we can say, we're here, we want for you what you want for yourself, you know, and tell us how we can walk with you. And how the community can help each other, really just the, the encouragement. With your help, Cornerstones can bring people together to harness the strategies, program expertise, and resources for those in need to provide greater community well-being for everyone.